This is Life's Tough, but explorers are tougher. I'm your host, Richard Weiss. I love the outdoors. I always have, and I always will. I've heard stories that would make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. Explorers are the type of people who walk in space, go to the bottom of the ocean, and stand on the highest summits. Scratch the surface of any explorer and you'll find they're all storytellers. This show is about their tales. Our guest today, Dr. Kenneth Lacavera, is best known for his discovery of the Dreadnoughtus, possibly the largest dinosaur ever to roam the Earth. He is founder of the Edelman Fossil Park at Rowan University in New Jersey, author of the best-selling book, Why Dinosaurs Matter, a hell of a treehouse builder, and during his free time, a professional jazz drummer. Welcome to Life's Tough, Ken. <laughs> Thanks, Richard. Great to be with you. So, you know, I, I have to start right in New Jersey. When you do a Google search of New Jersey, dinosaurs are not the thing that sort of pops up first. And so you have this fantastic fossil park, the Edelman Fossil Park. It's in Southern New Jersey. It is um, perhaps the most unique dig site in the world. Take me through why New Jersey and why the Edelman Fossil Park? Sure. Well, you know, when you think of New Jersey, you should think of dinosaurs. Um, the world's first nearly complete dinosaur skeleton was found in New Jersey in 1858. The world's first tyrannosaur was found in New Jersey a mile from the fossil park in 1866. So it's, it's really a great place for dinosaurs. And at the Edelman Fossil Park of Rowan University, we have the best exposure into the Cretaceous period, into the last of the time of the dinosaurs, um, really east of the Mississippi. And it's, it's one of the most important exposures of this, this time in the world, I think. And so um, if you go back 66 million years ago to the end of the time of the dinosaurs, the world is very warm, it's very verdant. Uh, there's no ice in the poles, there's no ice in the mountains, all that water is in the ocean. So it raises the level of the sea by hundreds of feet, so much so that at that time, the Gulf of Mexico came up through North America and connected to the Arctic Ocean. So North America at that time was really two big islands and New Jersey would be off the east coast of the Eastern Island of North America. Now, all dinosaurs lived on land and this was a marine environment, but what happens is that sometimes dinosaurs die on the beach. And this has actually been shown experimentally, it's kind of gross, but when an animal dies on the coast, they can end up in the water, they'll get a lung full of water, they sink, and then the bacteria go to work and the decay gases build up in the carcass and these giant dinosaurs become like these huge bobbing meat buoys floating out to sea. And as the carcass rots, then parts of the skeleton start to drop out to the seafloor and that's where we find them as fossils. They're marine deposits, they're terrestrial animals, but we get this great mix of both marine and terrestrial at the Edelman Fossil Park. But, you know, the Edelman Fossil Park is, and I've been there, been there several times, as you know, mm -hmm. digging with my kids, your kid. Um, it's behind a Lowe's uh, department store. And when you think of, um, Dinosaur digs, you might think of Mongolia. Obviously, Argentina plays a big role in your discovery of Dreadnoughtus. How did you come upon this area off of Exit 2? What is it, Swedesboro, Exit 2, New Jersey yep. Turnpike? Yep, that's right. Um, so remember, I mean, in the Cretaceous, this is not New Jersey, right? This is a wild, wild country like every other spot in the world. And dinosaurs were cosmopolitan. We only think of them from places like Mongolia and Montana and Patagonia, because that's where now, that's where the rocks are exposed now, because those are deserts and badlands and you get good rates of erosion, but they were all over the planet. So anywhere on the planet where you have rocks of the right age, if you can get to those rocks, you can probably find dinosaurs. And we have essentially an artificial badlands at the Edelman Fossil Park. It's, it's a former marl mine. Marl is a farmer's term, but it's, it's a kind of sediment, it's a marine sediment that 
is a very good fertilizer. It's also used as a, a water treatment product. And so we have a four acre quarry there that when you're in it very much looks like a bad land. So now we have rocks of the right age and we have the exposure. Um, and paleontologists had known about this place for decades, long before me. I mean, if, if you wanna find a paleontologist, just dig a hole, right? <laughs> and they will show up. Um, so I began going there in the uh, early 2000s. Really, I was a professor at Drexel University in Philadelphia at the time, and, and really just to have a place where my students could collect some fossils, where they could be trained in excavation. But my research mind wasn't really in it. I would go then off to Egypt or Patagonia or the Gobi Desert or places like that doing my research. And then it slowly dawned on me as we started excavating more and more. And I have to say, like, embarrassingly slowly uh, that this place was important. And in 2011, the mining company there started to go belly up. And the township had a plan that they were going to fill in the quarry and build a shopping plaza, like a, a Costco or something. And by then I knew that it was pretty special, but I, I still didn't know fully how, how great it is. And I thought, well, it would be really a shame to lose this resource. It's so close to you know, a populous area. So I marched into the township office in my muddy green boots. I happened to, to find a woman. The first person I met was Michelle Bruner, who you've met, I know. And um, I said, do you know what you have here in your township? Do you know the amazing treasure that you have? And she didn't. And so she took a ride with me. We went over to the quarry and she got it like that. And then she was in gear. We, we formed a team and we tried to preserve this 65 acre property. And eventually that precipitated my move from Drexel University to Rowan University because the president of Rowan really got the significance of this and um, had the university buy the quarry. Gene and Rick Edelman stepped up a year later and donated $25 million, an amazing gift. Um, to get the Edelman Fossil Park off the ground. And now we are building a $67 million museum. It'll be a, a 45,000 square foot building that will open in the spring of 23. And it will have um, exhibit halls that will feature the dinosaurs on the East Coast. Nobody else does this. Usually when you go to a museum, it's just a hodgepodge of whatever they happen to have collected. So this will feature the dinosaurs of the East Coast. And then you go into the next gallery and it's the creatures that actually were right under your feet, the creatures that were found on the property, like a 55 foot long mosasaur and lots of sharks and crocodiles and turtles. And then we go into a gallery called the, the, the Gallery of Extinction and Hope. And that will take the visitors through the events that precipitated the world's fifth mass extinction in which the dinosaurs and 75% of species went extinct on our planet. And we have uniquely occurring evidence of that event right at the Edelman Fossil Park. And then we go forward into the sixth extinction and we will show our guests the truth of climate change and the biodiversity crisis and everything that is unfolding as a result of humans and then give them hope. Um, hope to uh, stabilize our climate, hope to save and restore our environment, and hope that they can act no, not only as individuals, but to group together with organizations like the Explorers Club um, to do things that they wouldn't be able to do on their own. So we're really trying to activate people to use the past as a lesson uh, for the future, because you know, if you learn to read the rocks like you have, you were a geology major. Um, wherever you go in the world, the rocks will whisper the same thing to you. And what they always say is, it didn't have to be this way. It didn't have to be this particular way. Like the, the earth didn't have to have dinosaurs, but that's just what happened. And then they dominated the terrestrial ecosystems for 165 million years until accidentally, they were snuffed out by an asteroid collision that didn't have to happen. And the earth didn't have to have humans and it doesn't need humans. And our persistence on this planet is not foreordained. We're not the recipients of some cosmic proclamation of manifest destiny. We got lucky. And if we wanna to continue to be lucky in the future, we have to care for and shepherd this little ball of rock that we live on. As Carl Sagan said, the only home we've ever known. Ken, it's interesting that you 
mention it didn't have to happen this way and that serendipity always plays some role on mass uh, on a mass uh, scale, but also personally. I mean, I've known you for a while and you didn't happen have to happen upon the largest dinosaur ever found, the Dreadnoughtus in Argentina. You didn't ha have to happen upon this pit in New Jersey. One of the things that um, you fail to mention right here and why it's so special is that smoking gun aspect of Edelman uh, Fossil Park. You, you care to elaborate on that a little more? Sure, and you know, I, said, I should preface this by saying that this is research in progress, but uh, what we appear to have there is we can see that we have a mass death occurrence near the bottom of the quarry. And we can also see that it lines up right at 66 million years, which is when the world's fifth mass extinction occurred. Now, the question always is, is that really a mass death event or did those skeletons accumulate gradually? We can see that, we did, that they didn't because we have really exquisite preservation of these skeletons, all kinds of really fine and subtle details preserved that would not be preserved if these skeletons you know, got roughed up while they were transported or if they sat on the seafloor for a long time. So we can see they all lived together and died together and were buried together. Um, and it doesn't seem like it's just a local effect because what we're seeing is evidence of terrestrial disturbance, things that are floating out and sinking on the seafloor, including lots of wood, which you know, would have happened that, that terrible day in Earth history, lots of marine creatures dying. And then we start to find the signatures of the impact itself. So it's looking to us like the one place on the planet where you can see an ecosystem that has collapsed and fossilized at the end of the Cretaceous period in the world's fifth mass extinction. The only place on the planet where you can really see that is in this quarry behind the lows in southern New Jersey. And you know the other fantastic aspect of it is again we know of famous um, paleontological sites in Mongolia, even in Alaska, a lot of places, but I can't think of another one in the world that is so close to large population centers, um, New York, uh, Philadelphia, and that the people who go to your park can actually go home with something they find. That, that has to be, can you think of another place in the world where there is something like this? I really can't, Richard, and, and that's one of the things that, that I really love about the Edelman Fossil Park. I mean, there's La Brea, right, but you don't want to let your kids go in the tar pits. Um, so we have layers in the quarry above this, this research layer that obviously we you know, protect and, and curate very carefully. But above that, just after the time of the dinosaurs, uh, there's still a lot of fossils to be found. And so we can let visitors go into the quarry. And right now it's, it's only with um, group events, but when we open the museum in 23, it'll be any day of the year, and visitors can go into the quarry and with their own hands, find a 65 million year old fossil that hasn't seen the light of sun until that very moment when they touched it. And they can be explorers, they can be discoverers. And I've seen it over and over. That that clam, that oyster, that snail, maybe a little piece of turtle shell, whatever it is that a kid finds, that little fossil is more important to them than all the T-Rexes in all the museums of the world because they found it with their own hands and they made that personal connection between themselves and the Earth's deep past. And so it's, it really can just be a, a magical place. And you know, the reason that's so important is I always call dinosaurs <laughs> I call them the gateway drug to the sciences, right? And Definitely. we bring kids to the fossil park and like literally we're giving them free samples, right? And we get them hooked on science through fossils. And the world doesn't need millions and millions of vertebrate paleontologists. But if you inculcate them with the scientific method, if you give them the tools to receive and process information in rational ways, well, now that's the way they think. And they can go on and apply that thinking to other disciplines in science, to engineering, to business, to whatever. And so we think that we're growing scientists, we're growing engineers, and we're just growing better minds uh, by getting kids excited about science and, and the scientific method early on. Can you ever 
reflect on how your life has evolved because I've known you a long time and there has been really one great event after another. You started as a kid, probably interested in dinosaurs, but did you ever see it going to where you would be overseeing a fossil park right outside of where you live, that you are sort of the toast of the TED Talks, you received the highest honor from the Explorers Club, the Explorers Club medal, you've been on the front page of the New York Times. I mean, how do you keep it in perspective? Well, uh, I didn't expect any of this. Um, and you know, I, I can't say I was out to achieve any of this either. I mean, really what I did was I followed my passion and my passion turned into a career and my career then has been dotted with you know, some of these events that you noted. Um, but really I consider myself very fortunate. And you know, have I worked hard? Yeah, I mean, I've busted my butt uh, as you have, as you know, I think almost all successful people have. And it's not hard to find at the Explorers Club people to admire. But I think in all those cases, there's, there's hard work, but there's gotta be luck also. And, and I feel immense gratitude for the good fortune that I've experienced. My father was a carpenter, right? Um, I, people talk about first generation college. I'm first generation high school. So there was no like academic expectation for me whatsoever. Uh, and so I just feel very fortunate that it turned out the way that it did. And, and, you know, the one thing that I think kind of unites the people in the Explorers Club is that you're willing to take a chance. And the successes that I can point to in my career have all been because I was willing to go to places that other paleontologists weren't willing to go. I was able to dig in conditions that a lot of people wouldn't want to dig in. I took chances, you know, building a museum and a fossil park. I'm not trained in this. It's a big chance, but, you know, I think all explorers know that, you know, if you see a door that's cracked, you kick open that door because, you know, that's, that's how the magic happens, right? So what did your parents think of your career direction? You mentioned that, you know, graduating high school was a big deal. Obviously you went on further. Did your father uh, live to see you get a PhD? He did. My mother didn't. Uh, my mother passed, unfortunately, while I was in graduate school. Um, that had to be tough. It, it was really hard. Probably the, the hardest thing I've been through. I, I actually took a year off graduate school to move home and to care for her while she had uh, breast cancer. So that was a rough year. Um, my father got to see me uh, earn my PhD and become a professor, and he never quite understood what it was that I was doing until, and you'll appreciate this, until I got on television. <laughs> and then it was like, you know, then he became like my, my one person press agency. <laughs> and it was like, hey, my boy's on the television. And so that was, after that, then that was the seal of approval. And, and he was a big fan of it all after that. Did you, did you have a mentor, somebody that you looked up to who was sort of, that you said, man, I want to be like so-and-so. Who, who was your hero growing up? Well, I did. and. Um, I only got to meet him briefly once, and it was Carl Sagan. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't know any scientists. I didn't know any professors. The only people that I really knew that went to college were my high school and grade school teachers. Um, but when Cosmos came out, when that book came out and the television series, I had read that. And I was actually, at the time, I thought I was going to be a professional musician. Uh, as you mentioned, I, you know, I play the drums and I had started to have a career that way. I was the house drummer at the Golden Nugget Casino in Atlantic City. And you know, <laughs> I, for a young guy, I was making a ton of money. It was great. Um, but I had always been interested in, in geology and in fossils since I was a, a little kid, since the second grade. And I read that book and I felt like he had just drilled into my brain and was speaking just to me. And I thought, no, I have to be a scientist. I have to find a way to be a scientist. So I went back to college. I, I took what is now called a gap year. Back then it was just called dropping out. <laughs> um, but I went back to college 
uh, finished my degree, did, got straight A's in, in my last few years. That got me into a good master's program at the University of Maryland, did really well in that. And that got me into one of the top geology programs in the country at the University of Delaware and uh, did well there. And then I got very lucky to land a professorship right out of the gate at Drexel University. And then the very first expedition I got to be involved with, um, I had teamed up with some colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania, which is literally across the street from Drexel. And we had hatched this plan in 1999 to go to the Baharia Oasis in Egypt, which is nowhere. That's, it's halfway between the Mediterranean and Sudan, halfway between uh, the Nile and Libya. So like nowhere. Um, because in, in 1911, a German paleontologist, Ernst Stromer von Reichenbach, had found four new species of dinosaur there, including the iconic Spinosaurus. It's T-Rex size with a six foot sail down its back. It was in one of the Jurassic movies. Um, eventually got all that material to the Bavarian Museum of Paleontology in Munich. And then in April of 1944, an allied air raid destroyed the museum and wiped out those species. And most dinosaur species are known from single specimens. So the world lost those species and they, be they became known as the lost dinosaurs of Egypt. So me and a, and a couple of friends at Penn, we hatched a plan to go back to Baharia and recover the lost dinosaurs. And we couldn't figure out a way to fund it. And then we made a connection with somebody uh, at a film company in Los Angeles. And they decided, well, this would make a great television documentary, but then they had to figure out a way to fund it. And the way they got it funded was Andrewian, Carl Sagan's widow funded my expedition to launch my career to go to Egypt. We didn't find the lost dinosaurs, but in the process, we discovered a new dinosaur that I named Paralatitan, which at the time was the world's second largest dinosaur. So it was Carl Sagan's book that really inspired me to become a scientist. And then it was Andrewian who really helped launch my career. So very symmetrical. Yeah, it's very ironic too. And I, I know you've had a friendship with her over the years. Yeah. You know, I also, reflect a little upon your experience as a public speaker. Um, you're famously one of the most popular uh, TED Talk speakers. People seem to love your talks and it's not hard to understand why. And suddenly you're friends with Al Gore. Uh, I think your TED Talk mentor is Monica Lewinsky. Mm -hmm. Did that all seem kind of, again, a pinch me kind of moment? Because again, a guy who drops out of college didn't necessarily have access to famous people as a child. Do you ever just sort of, um, and I've seen you in these situations, you're, you're the same as, as you are at home, which is great, but it's got to be an aspect of you that just has to take notice of that and find it somewhat funny or ironic. It can be a little surreal. I mean, you know, usually when I meet famous people. I mean, they're just people. And I try to interact with them in that way. And, and that usually works well, because I think for the most part, they think of themselves that way also. Um, but there are moments, I mean, you know, when I was standing up on, on the red circle, giving my TED talk, I, I look out in the audience and, you know, there's Bill and Melinda Gates, there's Sergey Brin from Google, there's Goldie Hahn. I look over there, there's Harrison Ford. I look over there and there's Cher. I just thought for a moment, like, where am I? What happened to me? And then I thought, expletive it. <laughs> I'm the professor. This is my classroom. I'm just going to do my thing and, and kind of all the tension drained out of my body. And by the end of it, I had this little meta narration like, hey, I'm giving a TED talk and it's going OK. And they're share. And, <laughs> and then I got off the stage. Every, you know, everybody stood up and clapped and it went really well. I get off the stage. I walk down the steps. And Cher pops out of her chair and gives me a flying hug. <laughs> and it was just. Oh my God, that, that, that is so surreal because, it, you know, you and I both grew up and Cher had a TV uh, show, The Sonny and Cher Show. Sure, and, yeah. And, you know, she had all these hits. And to suddenly be um, hugged by Cher just seems so random in life. It was, it was crazy. It was, it really was. <laughs> So, so can you have a book and it's fantastic in case anybody has not read it. I think it's, um, it really in a very intelligent, entertaining way states a case why dinosaurs matter. So why do dinosaurs matter? 
Well, you know, I could have used almost any animal, but I chose dinosaurs, right? Because people are interested in dinosaurs because, because they are that gateway drug. Um, and really the answer to that question is I would reframe the question as why does the past matter? And the past matters because the future matters, right? And, you know, our present is nothing, right? Like the sentence I am speaking right now is already in your past, right? So the present is nothing. Um, the future we don't have access to, right? Nobody can do experiments in the future. Nobody remembers the future. So where do we get our information? We get essentially 100% of it from the past. And it was Winston Churchill who said, the further back you look, the further ahead you can see. So if we really wanna understand these mega changes that are going on on our planet right now, if we really want to understand the deep and perilous environmental future that we are sailing into, we have to look to the past. We have to attend to the past. And there are answers there. And the answers, frankly, are scary. And you know, as I mentioned before, like the earth didn't have to have dinosaurs and it doesn't have to have humans. And if you look at the dinosaurs, their, their hegemony spanned 165 million years. They're doing great at the end of the Cretaceous. They're, they're biodiverse, they're cosmopolitan. If you were on earth the day before the end of the Cretaceous, you would look around and you would think, these things are gonna be in charge forever. There's nothing that's ever gonna put the dinosaurs out of business. And then the asteroid hit and probably within an hour, they were all gone, they were all dead. And when you think about the contingency of that, asteroids form at about the same time the planets form, right? So all this solar system material is all about four and a half billion years old. And that asteroid had been out in the asteroid belt for almost that whole four and a half billion years. It just came in 66 million years ago. Well, if you go out four and a half billion years ago and, you know, hit that asteroid with, with a piece of popcorn or blow on that asteroid, which I guess you can't do in space exactly. Um, well, then it doesn't hit the earth 66 million years ago. And the dinosaurs, which are dominant for 165 million years, why not another 65 million more? And then if that doesn't happen, then our ancestors, the little tiny shrew-like mammals in the Cretaceous, well, they spent the entire Cretaceous period and beyond before trying to stay out of the way of the dinosaurs. That's why we were nocturnal. We were tiny. We were living in the little hidey holes, the little forgotten recesses of the dinosaur world. And then the, the dinosaurs go extinct. And there's some new studies that show it was only a couple thousand years before some mammals went from nocturnal to diurnal, to daytime creatures. And then it was only like 5 million years before we see the first proto-primates and 10 million years before we see primates, our lineage. So none of that happens if the dinosaurs don't get wiped out. And so, you know, we really have to understand the past and we really have to see how contingent it all is as we go forward into the future. And right now it's, you know, it's hard to have hope because of what we're doing to the planet and the climate limits that we have already exceeded. And the reality is we have broken the planet and it's not going back to its former state within the lifetime of our civilization. And so now the challenge is how do we stabilize it? How do we stop further damage? And how do we maintain the planet in a state of sustainability before it really spirals out of control, which now is a, a real and serious possibility. And we're not going to understand how to do any of that if we don't understand the past. Ken, you know, I've always thought of you as an optimist. Uh, whenever I talk to you, you're very upbeat. You, um, you're a problem solver or you look to solve problems. If someone were listening to this and they thought to themselves, man, I'd really like to put myself on a good trajectory. I'd like to, I, my past is my past, but the future is still open. What advice do you give people to sort of set their life on that upward trajectory? Well, first I would say that hope is a choice, right? Hope is not some empirical derivation that we derive from the data. Hope is a choice. And I am hopeful about our future. I'm hopeful about the environment's future, not based on data, but because I 
choose to have hope and having that hope then makes it possible for me to engage in action. And we all have to band together to do what we can do. And, you know, certainly there are things that we can do as individuals and they help, you know, use less plastic and cut down on your energy consumption and eat less meat is a really impactful thing to do for the environment. It's hard for me because I am like uber carnivore. I spent all that time in Patagonia where you would starve if you didn't eat meat. But meat is really tough on the environment and I'm really trying hard to eat less meat. If you haven't tried products like Beyond Burger, they're actually amazing. And so there are some really great meat substitutes coming online now. But you can do what you can do as an individual, but more impactful is band together with groups like the Explorers Club, the Nature Conservancy, the Climate Reality Project. There's so many great organizations now where you can multiply your efforts and then as we've seen in our recent history, the single most powerful thing that you can do to help the environment, to help the planet is to vote. Uh, because the capricious stroke of a pen from an ill-informed or nefarious leader can wipe out everything we can all do as individuals. And you see now like, boom, we're back in the Climate Paris Accord. We rejoined the family of nations who are committed to fighting for our planet's climate, which is great. Um, so you have to fight this on every level. And I also think, you know, for scientists that are listening, really for any profession, the science isn't enough, right? Data only speaks to a certain type of person, right? It works on me. I know it works on you, but data doesn't work on everybody. So you have to communicate the climate crisis, yes, through data, but also through art, right? Through graphic art, through music, poetry, film. You have to communicate it to certain people through business models. You know, why is it good to, to be green and sustainable? You know, think of all the jobs that can be grown. Right now, the solar tech installer is the second fastest growing job in the country. And you have to communicate with people also as far as uh, engineering solutions, technological solutions. And so some people respond to that. And no matter what kind of person you may be, I think there's an avenue that can touch your heartstrings or, or, or hook up with your brain um, to activate you in this space. And we all need to be there because, you know, this is the only place we have. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, Elon Musk, but we're not going to put a million people on Mars. Mars is terrible. I hope we explore Mars. I hope there's an Explorers Club flag that goes along on that trip. But we have an entire continent here on Earth, Antarctica, that we can't even really turn into home. I mean, we have McMurdo and, you know, I, I looked it up. There's only been 11 babies ever born in Antarctica. So we literally don't even have a breeding population of humans on one of the continents of Earth. And Earth and, and, and Antarctica has niceties like air and water. <laughs> so we're really not going to do that on Mars. We're going to explore Mars, I'm confident, but that's not planet B. This is the only home we have. And, you know, you zoom back, you look at Carl Sagan's pale blue dot, and we are isolated. We're on this little rocky world, the biosphere. If you go to the bottom of the Marianas Trench, to the top of Mount Everest, that's about 12 miles out of the 25,000 miles or so across the earth. So that's, that's the thickness of an eggshell to an egg, but take half that eggshell away and then take another half away. And then what's left, take another 40% away from that. So it's just this little film, this little scum of, of biosphere that covers this rock in the deadliness of space. It's not much, it's easy to damage. And that's the only home that we have in the universe. So we better take care of our little lifeboat. Absolutely. Ken, I'd like to thank you for being on here, not only because you're a wonderful storyteller. And I, and I do believe there is a role for the storyteller. It's what people have been doing since they came out of trees and stood over lakes. But you make people fall in love with science and communication. And to me, that's a, a rare skill. So thank you for being on Life's Tough, But Explorers Are Tougher. Well, thank you, Richard. I appreciate you having me. And, you know, I appreciate your friendship for all these years. You've been a great leader of the Explorers Club and, and, and a great friend. And, um, you know, I'm really proud of what you are doing as well. Thank you. Well, there's mutual admiration 
for both of us. All right, Ken, thank you very much.